Let me come in a little bit from a DFI's perspective or maybe a government perspective. So I would say um, right now it's not a hype, it's more reality. And um, for private investors it might be becoming a hype and a lot of more money than before is going there. But for a public investor, especially if you have budgetary funds to initiate something <coughs> in an early stage investment, they want to see more. They definitely want to see more uh, than what is done because the feeling is that what is done right now, this can be done by commercial investments. So you don't need additional funds uh, to, to transform it. So they are very much looking more on a transformation, on a real leapfrogging to put in. So I think that's a little bit the two roles. And Sam, you said before you, you have to put the right people together. I think the problem is a little bit more complex because we are, have different people talking a very, very different language. So on one hand, you have the, the small entrepreneur um, who has his ecosystem surrounding him and on the other hand you have huge conferences, pol politicians talking about impact and leveraging public funds and they totally speak a different language. So I think the challenge is more how to bring these together so that they can understand what they are talking about because what we see is um, they use the same words, but they totally think different what they mean by impact. Impact for a private investor is totally differently defined than if you have a public investor coming in who wants to see statistics, who wants to have the measurements on the ground, who wants really to see the difference. For a private investor, I think it's already um, a leapfrogging or an impact investment if you move away from traditional sectors uh, to more innovative sectors. So I think we really have to bring both sides together so that they learn to speak the same language. I absolutely um, support that. Totally supportive of the idea of the language as being important. Just two other observations about the, the myth, if you like, and the, and the hype, I would I would suggest. Number one is the idea that because this is an impact investment, the underlying business is going to behave in some way differently than another business that may not be in an impact sector, um, I think is misleading. So what we find is when we're working with social entrepreneurs or social enterprises, in the end, the success is down to the same building blocks of any other business, which is around finding the people, finding the systems, getting the product right, getting the finance right, getting the marketing right. And all this is the heavy duty, sweaty work that is exactly the same as if you were making agrochemicals, which is not a social impact business. I mean, it, the, the building blocks is still the same, and there's no magic that happens just because you've said, well, I'm an impact investor, I'm investing in an impact business. It's still, the secret is getting the business right. And the second Second observation would be, it's it's odd how we, or curious I would say, how we expect social enterprises to behave differently than regular businesses in the sense of being magic. So we put a lot of expectation on social, on social enterprises. So whereas a large corporation wouldn't think twice, like a Microsoft, wouldn't think twice about subsidizing for five or ten years a new business unit before it became profitable on its own right. That is completely normal and accepted practice in general mainstream commerce. Whereas we look at a social enterprise and say, right, you need to be profitable in year two, otherwise you failed. And the idea of bringing in quite significant amounts of grant funding or subsidy to a private business as a legitimate way of getting a business to get to more interesting scale is not really widely accepted. It's almost seen as a dirty word. And I, and I, would, I would argue that Grant, use, use of more grant in the early stages is actually a good thing. It's more reflective of mainstream commerce and is what you actually need more of to get businesses or social enterprises to get to scale. I agree. David, did you want to comment? And Venkat? So microfinance has been mentioned. And uh, if, if I apply Sam's view to microfinance and I go back and look at the history, microfinance doesn't exist. Because when Eunice walked around the villages of Bangladesh and then went to the banks, all the normal business thinking said it doesn't exist. And had he listened to those people, it wouldn't exist. And then when he went into the villages, 
uh, everybody in the villages were thinking the same thing. How do we get the right person to talk to Muhammad Yunus? Uh, and they would take him to the right person, they thought. And Yunus would say, I don't want to talk to this person. Take me to the poorest woman in the village. And if they didn't take him to the poorest woman in the village, he left. Again, accepting the right people from the perspective of what most people think the right people were was wrong. Microfinance wouldn't exist if Yunus had talked to the right people. So if we're going to leapfrog, if we're going to take advantage of the India context, we have to understand that most of the people who most of the people think are the right people aren't the right people. And I, I can tell you that if you have a for-profit uh, healthcare effort that's targeted to tier three and tier four villages in India, you can get that product to market faster by partnering with a company, with an NGO like Ekel Vidlaya, then you could get it to market in any other way. And there's no one from the global north or any impact investing group that would ever have Ekel Vidlaya even in a meeting. They wouldn't know they existed, they wouldn't be in the meeting, they wouldn't be having the conversation, and they wouldn't garner the success that's possible if you actually have the really right people in the discussion. That's a good point. Um, Venkat wanted to make a point? Uh, no, the, 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 the partnering aspect, I think, is vital to actually make these transitions happen. And uh, uh, so that, that point, I, uh, I agree. And especially because the early stage enterprises, you need networks of all kinds to make things happen. A, because uh, the area of operations that you're operating in, uh, they are, the infrastructure, the knowledge networks, are not as efficient and smooth as they would in, uh, let's say, the, met the metro areas or the uh, city areas. So that's the reason why you need these networks to work. And also, you need the presence on the ground, because in those areas, you need people trust people. And that's the core message. If you can get across, then you can really scale. Yeah. Well, the two important points, and I think I do want to echo the fact that getting definitions and standards is critical before our industry really kind of uh, grows. And I think we are at the cusp of that as the impact investing industry. This is very hard to get commonality and same definitions even, you know, with 10 people in the same room, as you said. And so getting it across country is going to be hard. But this is something can be accomplished. Every industry, whether it was automotive or electronic, down to the last part, you know, they were able to standardize the industry. And the fact that the rest of the world goes to US and you say, hey, no, I now need a different adapter or converter and say, why doesn't this thing work? You know, that is an example that you can travel half the world and use the same adapter and get the same 110 or 220 volts and you are able to operate. I think we do need to get that out of the way very fast. But second, I think is, that some of the issues that we do not discuss is how do these problems really, what business models best solve the problem? We spoke non-profits and for-profits. I think in India there's a category in the middle called cooperatives, which have done dramatic jobs. So for example, India's first social enterprise, Amul, has five billion in revenues, five billion dollars of revenues. It's a cooperative where the profits go back to the producers. SEWA is world's probably largest women's self-help group. They actually registered their SEWA bank in 1972 in Gujarat. Before Yunus, before Yunus. SEWA bank never took a single dollar from Impact Investor. They went to poor women and took what is equivalent of 50 cents and one dollar. It's been 35 plus years. It's been sustainable from its first year of inception. And Rural women belonging to Seva are earning 20 to 25,000 rupees a month, and there are 2.2 million such women. It's not 10 or 20, not one or five village. They are in seven countries now. They do work in Afghanistan. And I think we, as we define this larger social economy, and that's up to everyone in this room here to think about how are we going to define this larger social economy which stands on its own might and stands up to the business economy. And the more we find ways we find to pool capital, pool execution agencies, we will be able to make sure that we can really lead the good life. Because if we don't do that, we abdicate our citizenship and leadership responsibility. There's the risk of the country 
which you just alluded to. What happens to the country if we don't do this? And that's then divided down to the risk of the states. There's, there's the risk of the enterprise, which is normally what investors say they're talking about. And then there's the risk of the investors themselves. Uh, one of the principal reasons that impact investing won't scale is because every impact investor wants a diversified portfolio, i.e. they're focused on their own risk. They're not really worried about the enterprise risk, and they're definitely not worried about the country or state risk. They're concerned about their risk. And if you ask any scaling social entrepreneur, assemble a set of scale funds from a group of investors who each want to have their own diversified portfolio, that is a non-starter. That is a waste of time. Any, any social entrepreneur we look at who's doing that, they're done. We have no interest in them. They do not understand how to scale. If you want to focus on the enterprise risk and relate it to the government risk, now that gets interesting. Because now if you can figure out how to assemble enterprises into groups that appeal to the objectives of the government, now you have a conversation between the enterprises and the government about real risk. How can the government de-risk my group of enterprises? How can my group of enterprises deliver to the government what they need? How can that collaborative relationship enable us to create a de-risk scaling activity across that state such that we really get where we need to go? The word I use is machismo, and I find the market rate returns crowd to be full of fake machismo. And it's fake because the whole thing about market rate returns is it's all about niching. It's all about finding a small space where I can still get those maximum prices, extracting those maximum prices, and getting those market rate returns. I, I can tell you that that is so much easier to do than something that's truly scaled, that solves a real problem, that grows across multiple countries, and who cares if it only gets an 8% return? The difficulty of doing that other stuff, that's the real hero. That's the real hard thing to do. You, you shouldn't even be able to complain machismo about niched market rate returns. That's easy. Yeah, and, and I think there's, those are great numbers, and I think the fact that uh, the impact returns were higher, at least for under $100 million funds in the study Jin did, then the non-impact funds really goes to show that there's reality in what we're talking and there's no hype. We did a similar study in India of 55 partial and full exits between 2007 and 2015, and the returns were 13%. Now, we would be worried if this was 20% and higher than portfolio returns or benchmark to Sensex, then it reminds everyone of 2010 and microfinance. And the question would be, what are these responsible exits? What are reasonable returns? Because you're dealing with a very sensitive sector. And that's when that hype becomes wrong. This hype, if it's about hey, something new is being born, it's going to be great. We are not on the bus yet. I think this is... This is nice hype to have, but I think if the hype was born, if those returns were obnoxiously large, and then the government was sitting up, is someone exploiting the poor? Are the investors here exploiting the poor? That would be, and, and people are looking at, should we play? That is where we be, should be worried as a sector, you know, what's going on here? I think that's an excellent point, but I would just draw the distinction that uh, between the public listed securities that fall into impact portfolios and the private, there is an ocean of difference in terms of what, what's, what's the outcome of these, these, uh, the decision to make these transactions. To, to my mind, and I, I would ask you this, the, co the coherence of our impact investing sector, to, uh, the social capital markets as, as, I, as, I, as I see them, are so fragmented, we are actually not a market. With how, how many of us who have direct equity investment portfolios in early state social enterprises actually have more than, you know, we can count on one hand, the number of exits? Very few. It's still, it's still kind of early. Yeah. early. And, one, and I think there is still danger, even if there were two, and if the, the reports that came out in the public suggested these were unreasonably high profits. I think 
we should all know we are in a sector where markets will have a limit. And we saw that this week earlier, those of you who were following news in New Delhi, because of this whole odd even formula, you know, uh, the Ubers and the other taxi uh, services refused to take out surge pricing. They were banned. A business model and several investors lost in this, this week alone money in New Delhi because, you know, the operators were unable to or were unwilling to kind of support a government's effort which was attacking pollution and, you know, congestion. I think these limits of markets is something we've got to stay sensitive to. And I think that is where our sector is just so sensitive because none of you want to be that investor in that Uber in India, that one law overnight and you're back to zero. So this is where we'll be more sensitive and we've got to be careful. Um, the other elephant in the room, the government. There is a social contract between the BOP population and the government, which is being disrupted when you charge for services, whether it's healthcare or water. And it's not enough to say that because somebody's paying, that that's enough of an indication. You need to have the government buy into it, be supportive of it. We know what happened in Andhra. I mean, I, I'm not saying exactly the same equivalent, but you can't avoid the government in this play when you disrupt that social contract. Uh, point number one. Number two, the can of worms has to be opened. Everything is about returns. Everything is about equity returns. So one indication, do we have enough of the correct instruments? Because if you're only going to judge what you've done through an equity return, that's not enough of an indication. One. Secondly, taking a cue from microfinance, too much claims of what microfinance can do was counterproductive. So credibility gap still exists for the impact investing and that has to be bridged by opening that can of worm. What I haven't heard is that impact story. And we heard a great story from Equitas, how they put impact first and uh, they still had 17x. So it can be done, but we're not hearing it because people aren't really opening that that can of worms, and we need to do that. I mean, I was in Bangladesh for many years, lived there for four years, and ran IFC's program there, and a good friend of mine who was the head of the government used to say, Anil, if I believe all the reports that I get from the, um, from the donors as well as from the big foundations, there should be no poverty in my country. There is a credibility gap. What we're claiming, why we're claiming this. I would suggest that part of what we have to do is create models that find the exceptions and and that models that find the exceptions it turns out when you're talking about a hundred trillion dollars of pension funds if you can find the pension fund exception model that can be several trillion dollars so it might be absolutely true that 90 percent of those pension fund investors are never going to consider anything else but if 3% or 4% did, it would be several trillion dollars. So you, 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 we spend our time looking for the exceptions. And, and part of the solution to this, we'd suggest, are finding those exceptions and building models that move resources to them. The, the SDGs are basically an admission to the world that the world needs trillions upon trillions of dollars of a new kind of enterprise. It's not a market rate return enterprise. It's a modest return enterprise that replaces unsustainable nonprofit models. And there are trillions of dollars of those models needed, and we will only get them started if we find a few trillion dollars of exceptions in the big money. Coming back to some of the earlier points raised, I think um, the spectrum of the flavors of money that are represented by the attendees of conferences like this is so wide. Uh, it, to, to the early stage uh, social enterprise investor, the absorptive capacity, and this is just purely a function of the limitations of external investors who don't really have depth in the country to find those pipelines, but the absorptive capacities are so limited. The only thing that differentiates us is that you know, we're a little bit more patient in response to the social entrepreneur who asked the question. There's probably a little bit more patience, a little bit more willingness to wait. The reality is that every single one of the early growth stage investors got together, picked one sector, energy, in one state, 
Rajasthan and did every deal we could in one year, we still wouldn't even move the needle. It wouldn't even register. That's just, you know, not to be negative, but I think the need to collaborate across the spectrum with our peers to be able to have dialogue with major foundations, DFIs, and, you know, the government at the end of the day seems to be a key, a key theme. Uh, so uh, thank you all for your attention. Uh, I hope this was a, a fruitful discussion uh, and an interesting one for all of you. And um, have a good rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.